آزادی بیان یعنی بند زیو فری سپیچ Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Some quite astonishing and startling things I think we've already heard from the side of the house this evening. Um, what I'm going to do is really try to respond to much of the substantive matter that's come from this side of the house and to clarify a number of misconceptions and myths that I think have been propagated in this debate so far about what our position entails and what burdens it imposes on people who will ultimately, when they leave this room, agree with us tonight. <laughs> Now... The first thing we need to just get clear before we move into any direct rebuttal is that the right to speak is not to be equated with the right to a public platform. And on many occasions already in this debate, this side of the House has equated those two things. The right to a platform is a special benefit and a special form of protected speech that therefore the bars and barriers to attainment thereof are greater than simply the, the ability to speak with someone next to you on a train, for example. A platform is different to the right to speak. But moreover, the right to speak doesn't equate to the duty to needlessly offend either. And there are complete, complete and very clear cases in which one can still speak without needlessly offending, and one should do that. And Barnaby's brilliant case of Mehdi Hassan is, is excellent. In fact, what he went on to say is that we shouldn't fart along in solidarity in the lifts with those people either. And this is often what people seem to be suggesting that we do. And finally, just in terms and by way of clarification, what we are not arguing this evening is that every controversial speaker deserves to be no platformed. And you don't have to agree with that to agree with us this evening. We're also not arguing that our position is necessarily in contradistinction with free speech. What this debate is essentially about is one of free speech absolutism versus a rather high bar for sp free speech with certain limits. And that's really the, those are the parameters of today's debate, and any attempt by this side of the house to confuse that is misguided. But what I want to say in terms of direct response to this side of the house is firstly that it's interesting that they do make these distinctions and then they run away and they say, well, the incitement of violence is of course nothing that we would like, but then they don't give us any analysis as to in boundary cases where incitement of violence isn't exactly clear what they would do about that. So we see that they've made those arguments and we see that they've made exceptions, but they haven't told us how, when, and why those exceptions are made. And we find that curious, ladies and gentlemen. But the further point is that what we would argue is that in crucial circumstances, and this is key, ladies and gentlemen, no platforming actually expands the frontiers of contestation and speech. Because clearly, ladies and gentlemen, the mere act of elocution cannot be reduced to the right of free speech. What's important when we contest ideas, when we debate, is the way agendas are set, is the way that assumptions are made, is the way that rooms are created, is the way that people are given time to speech. And clearly, in, in terms of speaking about power relations, The level at which we set the agenda is often a form of uncontestable speech. And we would argue that contesting speech at the root of the level of agenda setting not only combats problematic forms of fascism and racism, which is a kind of nice byproduct, but it also enhances the, the, the true and the fundamental act of contestation in democratic societies. So this notion that we prevent illocution doesn't necessarily always mean that we prevent expression or that we prevent speech. And in fact, it often creates better debates, ladies and gentlemen, because now we are having debates about transphobia. And now when Rhodes Must Fall says Rhodes should be no platform because there is no right to posthumous veneration, people are talking about the legacy of Rhodes, and we're actually having a more enriched discussion. So the notion that we contest speech at the root of agenda setting should not be confused with the notion that we are against speech per se. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, we hear from this side of the house that there's just no way to adjudicate. You know, racists are racist, but hey, these other guys might not be racist, so it's all subjective and we put our hands up in the air. What nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. The fact of the matter is that we live in a social context. I mean, I don't want to have to bring out the data here on, uh, you know, just this last year, uh, the questions of anti-Semitism in the, in the European Union, what Eurobarometer has said about how many instances of racial hate speech have been uh, uh, directed at vulnerable groups. Ladies and gentlemen, power relations are surely one way of adjudicating. 
If a group hasn't been allowed into Oxford until 1938, they've been systematically no, no platformed for 400 years. On what basis do you stand up and say that, oh, your subjective experience as a black person is kind of weighed the same as a bespectacled, balding, besuited white man? We can adjudicate, ladies and gentlemen. That's ridiculous. But also, ladies and gentlemen, this invisible hand notion that somehow we're going to reach this ejaculatory uh, million utopia where all arguments converge on the truth is also patent nonsense. Because if certain people are, no, are platformed and are privileged and their ideas continue to be propagated and society and material conditions fundamentally exclude people, then in what market does the truth win out by some magic bullet? And ladies and gentlemen, we think for these reasons, we are both on the side of free speech and we are on the side of justice. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.